Hello, bonjour, guten tag, namaste, vanakkam, habari. I am Bali Palendran and I'm calling from Stanford University in California. And welcome to this week's Global Immuno Talks. And I'm delighted to introduce our guest speaker today, who is Dr. Sing Sing Wei from the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, Dr. Wei is the Pauline and Lawson Reed Chair, Division of Infectious Diseases at the Cincinnati Children's Hospital and professor in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Cincinnati. He is an infectious disease pediatrician uh, with an innate and contagious passion for discovery to improve human health. Uh, he has made many seminal contributions to reproductive and developmental immunology uh, with direct relevance to improving pregnancy outcomes and health of infants. Uh, his laboratory has really pioneered many different techniques for tracking immune responses in the pediatric population and during pregnancy and utilize these tools to reveal fundamental immunological insights uh, into the interplay between pregnancy and immunity. Uh, he began his education when he did his undergraduate degree at the University of California in Berkeley, where he worked with Dr. Paul Bartlett. Um, there, he was interested in biosynthetic chemistry, and he was trying to synthesize small molecule inhibitors of mycobacterium tuberculosis. And then after his undergraduate degree, he pursued an MD PhD at the Albert Einstein College of Medicine in New York, where he, he had an epiphany. The very famous Barry Bloom, who was then a professor and department chair at Albert Einstein was in Sing Sing's committee. And during one of the committee meetings, Barry uh, suggested to Sing Sing that he might perhaps work on vaccines, which he thought were far more interesting and impactful in terms of how durable their effects could be in, in inducing protective immunity. So Sing Sing had this epiphany during that committee meeting and decided to switch track and he wanted to work on vaccines. But Sing Sing told me that Barry wouldn't take him in his lab to do a PhD. Rather, Barry suggested that Sing Sing should learn all about Shigella vaccines uh, in, the, in the laboratory of Dr. Marsha Goldberg, who was another professor at Albert Einstein College. So it was there that Sing Sing did his PhD. Following his PhD, he then did his clinical residency at UCSF, uh, and then uh, another residency in, pedi pe um, in infectious, pediatric infectious diseases with Dr. Chris Wilson. It was there that Sing Sing's work on understanding the immune system in neonatal populations and contextualizing this uh, with adult immune systems began, but really Sing Sing was very, very interested to get to the origins of how is it that the physiological state of the immune system in neonates uh, develops during ontogeny, if you trace it right back to preterm infants and then all the way back to pregnancy. So it is this really interesting span of time from pregnancy to neonates that uh, Sing Sing's work has really been pioneering. And so it's this theme that he has continued to this day in his lab. It's been 15 years that he's had his lab for. And um, he is, as I say, he's made many fundamental discoveries and provided us with many rich insights into how the neonatal immune components work, uh, but also moved the scope of investigation to the underlying pathogenesis of pregnancy complications and discoveries on how tissues on both sides of the placenta interact with each other. So uh, his pioneering work and his leadership role in these areas has been recognized by many awards and honors, including the Howard Hughes Medical Institute Faculty Award, the NIH Director's Pioneer Award, and the inaugural recipient of the Druckier Prize in Children's Health Research, and the E. Meet Johnson Award from the Society of Pediatric Research. So you can see Sing Sing is a remarkably accomplished pediatric infectious disease clinician who has done who made many pioneering contributions to this field. So it is my distinct pleasure and honor to welcome you, Sing Sing, to Global Immuno Talks. But before we begin, I believe we have to ask you a question. And the question that we'd like to pose to you is, what is the trait in your personality that has helped you most in your scientific career? Sing Sing. Uh, 
I think you're on mute, Sing Sing. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. And we can. OK. Well, yeah. All right. So thanks so much, Bali and the organizers for uh, Global Immune Talks for this forum um, and allowing me to participate and um, and and Bali, especially for that um, introduction. Um, with regards to your question, um, what's the best personality trait? Um, I, I think I would say and especially for the people that worked with me, um, most people would not say that I'm the smartest person, nor am I the most hardworking person. But I think um, part of what's allowed me to um, survive in academic medicine, I think has been the ability to try and communicate things and communicate problems and questions in simple, um, easy to understand ways. And, and I do that um, not deliberately, but um, purposefully. So then I can borrow other people's hard work and other people's smarts and then get them to buy into my my problem and, and my thinking. Um, part of that I think also includes um, freely admitting I don't know. And there's many, many things that um, I think we don't know about how our bodies work including the immune system. And so love to think about how to unpack and how to get to some new knowledge with you guys, not just today, but you know, moving forward as you guys listen to this online through through YouTube. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Sing Sing. That's a wonderfully refreshing answer. And I really, your humility is very inspiring. Thank you for that. So I think, uh, oh, before we you begin, I should say, as usual, we will not be having a formal Q&A session uh, after Sing Sing's talk, but rather, uh, if you have questions about his presentation, feel free to uh, ask him this through Twitter, and instructions on how you could ask him questions will follow his presentation and will be put up on the screen. So without further ado, Sing Sing, welcome. We're excited to hear your talk. So um, thanks again, everybody. Um, as Bali introduced, um, I'm an infectious disease pediatrician. And the way that I view immunology is really through that lens of taking care of um, sick babies and, and children. And I think this is um, some of the most recent statistics from the World Health Organization. And I think this illustrates um, the big problem for us. Um, so 5 million. Um, children under age five die each year. And then I think what's even more remarkable about these statistics is that nearly half of it occurs in the first month of life. And, and that's totally disproportional because the first five years, each month would represent under 2%, but yet nearly half of those deaths occur in that first month. And I think that illustrates the point that um, people are the most vulnerable when they're the firstborn. And then it puts a lot of pressure then on pediatricians to then um, think about um, how to um, improve the health of people um, when they're in this, this window of, of, of vulnerability. I think um, for scientists um, who are thinking about also how to have impact, um, you can define impact in many different ways, but I think one of a one way to think about it is if you can take off major pieces of this pie, then wouldn't that have an enormous impact? Um, and so um, I want to just subdivide um, the parts of this pie that are highlighted in yellow here into two big categories that I'm going to try and touch upon today um, based on the work that we're doing. Um, one is um, related to pregnancy, how pregnancy works, and, and pregnancy complications. And, and the second is um, related excuse to- Excuse me, sorry, we can't see your screen. Oh, you can't? Can you no. see my screen now?
No, not yet. Yes, we can. No, we can put it in full screen. Can you see it now? Yes. Uh, can you put it on presentation mode if you can? Or maybe you can't if this is a PDF. Can you see it? Um, I'm swapping displays in, in presentation mode right now. Okay, that's that's fine. This is good. Thank you. Okay. So um, the second category of um, things that kill newborn babies is related to infection. And so I'm going to start the talk by um, telling you guys some of the work that we've done related to uh, addressing the these these points. Okay. Um, I, I think the first question is that we all recognize that babies are more susceptible to infection, but I think we don't really understand why why that's the case. One of the classic dogmas had been that, well, the immune cells that fight off infection must be immature in newborn babies, just like their lungs are immature, their intestines are immature, and their brains are immature and require a period of postnatal maturation. Maybe their immune cells are also immature, and then while they're immature, then they can't fight off infection as well. And some of the dogma that relates to that is some of this data here that I'm showing, where if you stimulate um, neonatal cells um, from cord blood with micro um, compared with adult cells, you can see that neonatal immune cells are grossly hyporesponsive with regards to production of pro-inflammatory protective cytokines that are you know, protective against all, all sorts of different types of infection. And then um, we began looking at this data by asking the question if hyporesponsiveness really equals in immaturity in, in this type of context. And I think several years ago now, I think we, we were the um, um, first group to formally test this hypothesis by mixing neonatal immune cells with adult immune cells to see if we put neonatal immune cells in an adult environment or adult immune cells into a neonatal environment, would that hyporesponsiveness be cell, cell intrinsic? And, and we did this in a special way in mice um, because in mice we can use um, different strains that express um, different congenic markers. So then once we put them together, we can still distinguish adult cells within, within neonatal mice. And what we found is that no matter how much um, adult cells you put into neonatal mice, um, those neonatal mice remain grossly susceptible to infection. So for example, these are recoverable CFUs after listeria infection in neonatal mice in red compared with adult mice. And that difference in susceptibility has nothing to do with um, adult mice being bigger, because if you mass adjust the inoculum, then they still remain very resistant compared with neonates. But no matter how much adult cells you pun punch into neonates, um, <clears throat> neonatal mice remain very, very susceptible to infection. And then when we looked at the cells more closely, what we found is that neonatal immune cells after listeria infection, just like in cord blood, generally are hyporesponsive with regards to production of pro-inflammatory cytokines, in this case, TNF-alpha, um, compared with adult immune cells. But what was really interesting is the adult immune cells that we could distinguish um, in neonatal mice that we um, parked into neonatal mice also had this hyporesponsive phenotype. And this is what led us to conclude that neonatal um, hyporesponsiveness of neonatal immune cells more reflects active suppression in this developmental window instead of in immaturity of, of, of these cells. And we further went on to show that um, active suppression in the neonatal window isn't there to make neonates more susceptible to infection, but it's really there to protect neonates from catastrophic um, inflammation that would otherwise occur when they transition from a sterile and utero environment to the external world that's filled with commensal microbes. 
And that's because if you deplete the cells that mediate the, the suppression, then um, you have massive uh, microbial driven uh, inflammation at mucosal barrier tissues like the intestine and, and, and the lung in, in, in neonates. And so why babies are susceptible to infection, it's not because their immune systems are immature, it's for a greater good that protects them so that they can optimally transition from a sterile environment to the external world that's filled with that's filled with microbes. Um, when, when we learned that, I think what we tried to do is then find ways where we can take away the suppression so we can optimally prime neonatal responses so, so that they could be more protective of, against infection. I illustrate this as sort of this window of susceptibility in newborn babies. When you prime um, with vaccines, it takes time for those protective adaptive immune components to develop. And we tried many, many different ways to take away suppression in neonates so that we can mount bigger and more robust and earlier vaccine-induced responses. And, and invariably, we failed. Okay? What we often saw is that when a baby gets infected, um, there's very little that you can do to make it protected in terms of, of vaccines. And so that's why our, our lab and our concept um, shift, shifted over the years to think about instead of priming bigger and better responses in newborn babies, to think about how we can prime protective immune responses in mothers and have those then protective immune responses be naturally transferred um, to babies um, through, through vertical transfer. And as you can see, um, what's known about vertically transferred adaptive immune components is that there's tons of antibodies that are transferred, okay? Uh, maternal IgG, we know readily, uh, crosses the placenta, and we can find tons of IgG in newborn babies dis despite having um, um, B cells that, that haven't been exposed to, 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 to much antigen. But I think this also then creates a dilemma. Um, this is a um, picture from Jane Way's textbook in immunology, where he compares the different types of adaptive immune um, cells and components and sees um, which ones do different things. And what um, I think immunologists recognize is that you need both arms of the adaptive immune system humoral immunity produced by B cells and also cellular immunity in the form of T cells because they do very different things. Antibodies generally protect against extracellular pathogens, but because antibodies cannot gain access to the intracellular compartment of cells, um, that's why you need T cells that then sample the intracellular compartment and then pro provide protection against microbes that, that live with, within, within cells. And so um, when we started this work, we, we asked, um, can vertically transferred immune components then also protect against intracellular infection? Because it seemed like if it was exclusively antibody-mediated protection, then we would be losing immunity against a big, broad classes of microbes that, that, that live inside cells. And, and we were especially um, optimistic because um, others had shown that um, there's a bidirectional trafficking of cells between mother and baby during pregnancy, and then the retention of especially maternal cells um, in offspring after they're born. And, and these, this phenomenon is called microchimerism, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But what we wondered is if the maternal cells that establish microchimerism in babies could be T cells and um, pathogen specific T cells that then would make babies per, more protected against infection upon, upon vertical transfer. And for these studies, we use the same bacteria, Listeria monocytogenes, not only because it's an important prenatal pathogen, but also because it's an exclusive intracellular intracytoplasmic pathogen. And many cellular immunologists have used this as a model pathogen to probe how T cell immunity 
is is prime because protective immunity um, had been pretty clearly shown to be exclusively mediated by T cells with little to no contribution for, for antibodies. Okay. So we designed experiments that I think many cellular immunologists do where we take a mouse um, and, and um, administer a sublethal dose of Listeria, let the infection resolve, and then challenge that mouse with different bugs and, and see what the recall memory T cell response was, would be. But instead of doing that, we instead impregnated the, the mouse. And instead of challenging the mouse that we primed, we challenged the neonates that are born from the mouse. So instead of looking at protective immunity in, in, in the mouse itself, we're looking at the vertically transferred uh, components of, of protective immunity. And here's where we started um, seeing some things that were pretty interesting. Um, so in the light blue are pups that are born to mice that have previously been primed with a sublethal dose of Listeria. And you can see they're much more resistant compared with age match control pups that are born to um, Listeria naive um, mothers. What was even more interesting with this data is that maternal B cells and vertically transferred um, uh, antibodies seem to be essential because if we did the same experiment using mothers that are B cell deficient, um, what you can see is that the ability for the pups to be protected is lost. And in data I'm not showing you, in this type of context, maternal T cells are non-essential. And so now we had this sort of paradigm where it seemed like in the context of vertically transferred immunity, now antibodies somehow acquire the ability to protect against a prototypical intracellular pathogen like, like Listeria. Um, we, we did experiments to try to unpack how this works, and I think one of the most definitive and exciting experiments is when we dissociated vertically transferred immunity um, from the presence of antibodies. And, and this was done by Instead of um, having the pregnant mouse um, directly transfer those protective immune components to um, its offspring, we bled the mouse um, after the sublethal infection before pregnancy. In this case, called it virgin serum or virgin immune serum, and then um, horizontally transferred it to, to offspring. And what you can see is that the pregnant serum directly transferred to offspring is protective, but virgin sera directly transferred to offspring is, is non-protective. But what was really interesting is if you take this virgin serum that's not protective when you directly transfer it to offspring, but passage it through a pregnant mouse and let the pregnant mouse then transfer it to, um, to its offspring and look at susceptibility, then the serum then regains the ability to, to protect against infection. And because of this type of data, we knew that there was something changed about pregnancy that changed the composition of these antibodies that allowed it to acquire these protective properties. And here's a lot of negative data, but um, we showed the titer of Listeria antibodies is similar. The isotype distribution is similar. And in, including their glycosylation pattern at a first pass, including um, terminal galactose residues and terminal sialic acid. Um, but what we found is that um, although the proportion of the antibodies that had the terminal sialic acid was quite comparable, the type of si sialic acid that was present on these antibodies was quite different. So in the um, virgin animal, um, the majority of the anti-Listeria antibodies contained a acetylation group. And then in pregnancy, this antibody becomes deacetylated. And we showed this in a variety of ways, but um, including using lectins, which are basically proteins that are able to detect differences in glycosylation. And here is a um, lectin that's specific to the acetylated uh, um, sialic acid group. And that's very high in the Listeria-specific antibodies recovered from virgin mice, but the majority of those antibodies are deacetylated when, when you recover them out after pregnancy. And we did a lot of what we call glycoengineering. 
than to take non-protective antibodies, treat them with a variety of enzymes and add different glycan groups on it to then definitively prove that this was the, the molecular change that was occurring during pregnancy that allows them to acquire these protective features. And I'll just say that this data was published um, a little over a year ago, where we then um, explored the mechanism for how this one molecular change could affect so dramatically the protective effects of antibodies. And I invite you guys to, to read that paper. But then what we had here was a, 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 um, a, some data where it seemed like um, neonates and pregnancy weren't reading um, Jane Way's immunology textbook because in, in this figure from the textbook, it would say, well, um, antibodies should not protect against intracellular organisms, and that's why you need T cells. And, and I think that's why I put in the um, title for this talk, Immunology Learned from Mothers and Babies, because we're continuing to learn different facets for how the immune system works when we study it in the context of, of reproduction and, and pregnancy. And, and the, the last sort of data is, is, is illustrative of that. Now I'm going to transition to instead of step, um, talking about infection in newborn babies, I'm going to transition to talk about pregnancy and, and pregnancy complications. And, and in particular, I'm going to talk about um, preterm birth. Okay. This is a figure from um, a review written by um, Roberto Romero, where he called it preterm birth, one syndrome, many causes. And, and I edited it. I edited the title a little bit to highlight many, many causes because it's really, really um, complicated because it's so multifactorial. Mm. And I think this creates a dilemma because when you want to study then something complicated like pregnancy and preterm birth, um, there's not a natural attack point because then which one of these causes should you focus on in, in your research to to think about how, how pregnancy works. And, and this is um, an area that we struggled with quite a lot. And I'm gonna talk with you about our attack point and then try to explain to you why, why I think that's a reasonable attack point. I, I realize that there's no question and answer directly, but that there'll be a dialogue on Twitter. So I would invite any comments or, or discussion on this way of thinking to, to see if there's other ways that we can maybe do this better. Okay. So um, the perspective that we've approached this is from the perspective of parity, which is how prior pregnancy impacts the outcomes of another pregnancy. Okay. Here's data from one of the largest cohorts where actually parity was di directly considered in pregnancy outcomes. And they were looking at preeclampsia amongst over 700,000 women in a um, Swedish birth cohort. And what they found is that preeclampsia risk in the first pregnancy was about 4%. But if you looked at the women who didn't develop preeclampsia in the first pregnancy, then their risk of preeclampsia in the next pregnancy was reduced to 1%. And if you looked at Sub additional subsequent pregnancies, what you could see is that the rate of preeclampsia was further reduced than even lower in the third pregnancy and fourth pregnancy amongst women who didn't have that disorder in the first or, or prior pregnancies. And I think to us, this was a really exciting piece of data because it said Preeclampsia doesn't have to always be 4%. There's going to be populations or physiological states where it can be significantly reduced. And one of our goals then was to figure out how a prior healthy pregnancy changed women so that then their chances of preeclampsia were so reduced in, in the next pregnancy. And, and, and we thought that that would be good because if we can then therapeutically mimic those types of changes, then we can have maybe um, better, more improved therapies against pregnancy complications to, 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 minimize, to, to minimize them. 
another clue came from this type of data. So similar data where they're comparing preeclampsia in the first pregnancy with the second pregnancy, the gray and the blue bar. But in this paper, which is the California birth cohort, they did something else, which is also compare the rate of pregnancy uh, complication in the second pregnancy when there was a new partner compared with second pregnancy when it was with the same partner. And what you can see is that in the cases of second pregnancy by a new partner, that protective effects of the prior pregnancy seem to go away. So in other words, the protective effects of a prior pregnancy in reducing complications like preeclampsia seem to be um, partner specific. And um, this is data that we were keen to, to reproduce in animal models because then we would have a platform to then studying the immunology for, for how this works. And, and because of the partner specificity of these protective benefits, um, we were honed in especially on immune cells and adaptive immune cells because, because as far as we know, those are the only cells that are capable of distinguishing different partners in, in, in a pregnancy. So for example, other physiological changes that occur during pregnancy, like the uterus stretching and contracting or the um, hormonal surges of progesterone and estrogen, none of those would be able to explain the partner specificity of, of the protective benefits. And what you can see here is we can model um, the protective effects of a prior pregnancy um, against complications in the next pregnancy, also in animals, when we use um, pregnancies that are allogeneic. So in this case, we're probing susceptibility with prenatal listeria infection. And this is the sus um, um, susceptibility of mice during a first pregnancy um, with listeria infection. And then this is the susceptibility during second pregnancy in mice that had a normal first pregnancy that we didn't infect during, during the first pregnancy. And then um, what we quickly realized is that just like <clears throat> um, protection against complications in humans is partner specific, we could recapitulate that partner specificity um, in mice. And I think this is really important for us because it normalized a lot of the caveats of the human data. For example, things like dif potential differences in interpregnancy interval that's invariably prolonged um, when there's a new partner in the second pregnancy. Um, because in, um, in preclinical pregnancy models, we can normalize um, all of those factors to, to show that the protection really is partner partner specific. Um, because of that reasoning, we started focusing a lot on adaptive immune cells in mothers during pregnancy, and in particular, um, adaptive immune cells with fetal specificity. Okay. Um, this is just an introductory slide to CD4 cells. Um, as you know, CD4 cells um, can differentiate into different effector lineages, but also um, have the ability to differentiate into suppressive lineage, and in particular, um, regulatory T cells defined by the transcription factor FOXP3. And I especially want to highlight regulatory T cells in this context is because <clears throat> this is the subset of maternal T cells that seems to change the most dramatically during pregnancy. So this is peripheral blood CD4 cells in women who are not pregnant, and as pregnancy progresses, there's a progressive rise in the proportion of CD4s that are regulatory T cells. They seem to peak at mid-gestation and stay high until term. And, and other people had shown that in cases of preeclampsia and other pregnancy complications, this normal physiological rise in maternal regulatory T cells, so non-pregnant women compared with pregnant women that are undergoing healthy pregnancy, um, doesn't occur, and because women with preeclampsia then have this blunted expansion of, of, of regulatory T cells. Um, because of this data, um, our initial focus for how pregnancy works immunologically um, focused a lot on CD4 cells, and, and in particular, their differentiation into, into regulatory T cells. And, and we started by asking 
when during pregnancy these cells expand seemingly by twofold? Is it that regulatory T cells of every single specificity expand? Or is it that there's particular specificities that expand preferentially over others? And, and in this work, we develop really elegant um, transgenic and cellular immunology tools um, generated by Mark Jenkins and applied them to reproduction in pregnancy to show that when there's um, um, pregnancy and expansion of maternal regulatory T cells, when you look at them in bulk, it seems like those cells expand by 50 to 100%, but that's really inaccurate because it's really the cells with fetal specificity that are sometimes expanding by a hundredfold or a thousandfold, whereas cells of non-fetal specificity don't expand and sometimes even contract dur during pregnancy. And applied to parity um, and how prior pregnancy impacts the susceptibility to complications in the next pregnancy, we found that these protective maternal Tregs with fetal specificity persisted in mice after they gave birth, and then expanded with much higher um, tempo and kinetics in this next pregnancy in, upon encountering um, fe fetal antigen stimulation. And so here we sort of had a preliminary framework for then um, how mothers may, how prior successful pregnancy may reduce the susceptibility of women to complications of the next pregnancy that would occur in a partner-specific fashion, because the first pregnancy would prime an expanded pool of these memory-protected fetal-specific cells that stay in women after pregnancy and then provide increased resiliency <clears throat> um, in, 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 in a subsequent pregnancy. And with this um, sort of platform, we started trying to go deeper for then how, how does memory T-Rex form and what sustains um, this memory pool of fetal specific cells primed by a, pregnant, uh, primed by a pregnancy? And, and well, one of the ways to ask this question is, well, how did mothers remember? Okay, and is the persistence of those cells with fetal specificity true bona fide memory in that um, in that they don't require constant antigen reminders? Or is it memory in other contexts where low-level antigen persistence is required to sustain that functional me me memory pool of cells? And, and in the case of mothers remembering their babies, could there be a sustained low-level pool of um, fetal cells or source of fetal antigen that sustains that memory pool of maternal regulatory T cells with, with fetal specificity. And here's where I want to get back to the concept of microchimerism. I told you earlier that there's a bidirectional transfer of maternal cells to babies and baby cells to mothers during pregnancy, and that there's a persistence of maternal cells in babies after pregnancy, but there's also a persistence of fetal cells in mothers after pregnancy. And so, um, um, we can actually look at it both ways in terms of how these cells could potentially prime and engender um, constant tolerance in, in each individual. With regards to um, how, how daughters may remember their mothers, um, there was already pioneering work from Ray Owen where he was looking at um, differences in susceptibility to RH antigen sensitization amongst RH negative women. And, and he recognized there was actually two, two different groups of RH negative women, one that were born to RH negative mothers, but one that was born to RH positive mothers, but, but didn't inherit the RH allele. And so they were RH negative. And, and Ray, um, in this classical paper, described that um, women that were born to RH um, negative um, mothers were much, much more likely to be sensitized in the next pregnancy by an RH positive pa partner compared with women who were born to RH um, positive mothers. So in, in other words, that there seemed to be a actively acquired tolerance to this um, maternal um, 
non-inherited maternal antigen, in, in this case, R, RH. Many years later, um, Franz Klaas and John Van Rood described um, um, in the context of looking at um, people with kidney failure, um, and this is the days before availability of recombinant erythropoietin, where um, because erythropoietin is made by the kidney, that people with kidney failure then are transfusion dependent. And, and, and they noted that um, these transfusion dependent in individuals seem to be um, <clears throat> mount a lot of um, serological sensitization to all sorts of other blood group um, antigens and HLA antigens from the variety of different donors that they would need to sustain their, their red blood cells. But they would invariably um, be hyporesponsive to non-inherited maternal HLA antigens, again, highlighting that offspring could be tolerant to, to, to their mothers. And just as another example, this is work by um, Will Burlingham's group in, in Wisconsin, where they were looking at um, sibling to sibling, long-term renal allograft survival from sibling to sibling donors. And, and Will's group noted that if you had a matching in the non-inherited maternal allele, the, the long-term survival of renal allografts was nearly identical to HLA-matched sibling to sibling donors. Whereas if you were matched instead of for the non-inherited maternal allele, but the non-inherited paternal allele, then, then there was no, no, no protective effects. And, and, and we focused on this because at this point, this tolerance of offspring to mothers has been you know, recognized in several of these very spectacular examples and indirectly related to the presence of these microchimeric cells. And so um, our group tried to dissociate these phenomenon and tried to sort of uncover the chicken and egg relationship between microchimerism and tolerance of offspring to, to, to non-inherited maternal antigen. And, and our approach for doing that was de devising tools where we can experimentally, um, where we can experimentally deplete um, microchimeric cells in offspring or in mothers and, and look at the immunological and physiological sequelae of, of that type of experimental man manipulation. And, and one of the first things we recognized is that when you, um, when you um, have um, a population of people that are tolerant to their non-inherited maternal antigens, that provides what we call cross-generational reproductive benefits. Because in those daughters that um, are now not only tolerant to, in this case, the red self-antigens that she inherits by normal Mendelian inheritance, but the green non-inherited maternal antigens, then um, she's also tolerant to that. So that in the next generation pregnancy, if she encounters a, a partner with this overlap, then those are super resilient to, to perturbations in, in, in fetal tolerance. And I think this is one of the sort of first then transformations of microchimerism, and people had referred to them as accidental souvenirs of pregnancy, to now being purposeful. And, and one of the purposes is to engen engender this, this, this reproductive benefit. And, and there's likely to be many, many other physiological benefits, but I think um, this, this is one of the, the most impressive ones. And, and as soon as we realized that microchimerism wasn't accidental, but purposeful, then, then that opened up new questions as to, well, then how do these types of microchimerism cells in, interact with each other? So you can imagine this green lady in the middle, she would contain um, microchimeric cells from, from her mother, but then when she becomes pregnant, the first time she would um, have fetal microchimeric cells from the first child, and then from the second child, and then the third and fourth child, um, and et cetera. And then this then created um, new questions for us um, to ask, well, how did these different types of microchimeric cells respond to each other? 
So how do pre-existing maternal microchimeric cells respond to a seed seeding of new fetal microchimeric cells during pregnancy? And how do women with prior pregnancy who have pre-retained fetal microchimeric cells, how, how do they respond when there's new fetal microchimeric cells that are genetically different um, um, seeded? Um, and that's where I'm gonna spend the last few minutes talking about um, is what, what we found is something I think quite amazing is that when people are seeded with maternal microchimeric cells, it's really, really hard to make those microchimeric cells go away, except in the case of pregnancy. And in the case of pregnancy, it seems like you have a complete displacement of one set of microchimeric cells with a new set of microchimeric cells. And I illustrate that in this cartoon where this offspring contains orange maternal microchimeric cells, but when she grows up and encounters a partner and then has a baby, then the, the pre-existing orange maternal microchimeric cells become displaced by the fetal microchimeric cells from, from the first pregnancy. Um, and, then, and then we found that this, this type of displacement completely loses the tolerance that I described how daughters are more tolerant to non-inherited maternal antigens. So, so we said this, this shows that daughters seem to immunologically forget their mothers at, after pregnancy. But what's interesting, if we applied the flip argument, so we looked at different subsets of fetal microchimeric cells that are um, retained in women after pregnancy, what we found is that same, that same displacement occurs. So after the first pregnancy, there's a retained pool of fetal microchimeric cells that's just totally displaced by fetal microchimeric cells from the next partner and the next partner. But despite that loss of fetal microchimerism, when we look at pregnancy outcomes, mothers seem to remember immunologically all their children, despite intervening pregnancy and, and loss of what seems like those fetal an an antigenic reminders. And, um, and, and we tried for a long time to figure out how this works. And I think one explanation for this is that we, we may not have been looking exactly at the right cells. So in the prior data, we track the maternal cells with fetal, specific, with fetal specificity, focusing on the regulatory T cells or the cells that express FOXP3. In these types of more expanded experiments, we use lineage fate tracking mice where we can track not only FOXP3 Tregs, but cells that have ever become Tregs um, by crossing FOXP3 GFP Cre mice with Rosa 26D, D tomato mice. And then we established allogeneic pregnancy in a uh, male mice engineered to express model antigens, in this case, 2W1S and OVA. We let them deliver and we track the proportion of memory immune cells with fetal specificity, in this case, using 2W1S tetraemic enrichment. And you can see we can have a pool of these memory CD4 cells with fetal specificity. But what's interesting about their proportion is that um, a large proportion of these cells seem to um, have lost FOXP3 expression. So about 40% of the total D tomato positive pool is FOXP3 negative pool, which is very different than, than the bulk population for, for these cells. And what's even more interesting about this data is that if we deplete the pre-existing fetal microchimeric cells, then the the proportion of these cells that lose FOXP3 expression or turn into what people call XTregs becomes even more. So in, the, in this case, 60 to 80% of the maternal cells with fetal specificity are, are XTregs. And, and in data, I'm not, I don't have time to show you, we, we proved that it's really this XTreg compartment that's important for, for the ability of mothers to functionally remember their babies in terms of protection against complications in, in, in future pregnancies. Okay, so fetal microchimeric cells displace maternal microchimeric cells. Uh, new fetal microchimeric cells displace a pre-existing pool so that each person can have a fixed niche of, of microchimeric cells. Um, fetal tolerance seems to be more durable than maternal tolerance allowing for this X-Treg uh, differentiation. And that's why 
in the case of pregnancy, we, we made this comment that daughters seem to forget with a pregnancy, but mothers seem to always remember their babies. So here is just a snapshot, I think, of a few different examples where we're learning how the immune system works from studying pregnancy and, and what I call the maternal fetal diet. I think this has implications not just for um, reducing um, pregnancy complications and preventing um, infant and childhood mortality, but I think it also serves shows that reproduction in pregnancy is a really powerful lens to teach us how the immune system works that then can be applied to a variety of other contexts, including autoimmunity, transplantation, and, and, and cancer. So lastly, um, I just want to thank a few of the people that performed the work that I showed in this talk. Um, and here's a shameless advertisement for my lab here at Cincinnati Children's. I invite any comments or discussion um, via Twitter or any other platform, um, including email. Um, thank you so much, everyone, and um, look forward to the, the online discussion. Well, thank you so much, Sing Sing, for that wonderful talk. Very inspiring. And I think your love for children that you mentioned in your website comes across very clearly. And um, if I were a student, I would love to come to your lab and do research on some of the projects you talked about. But anyway, I really appreciate your lecture. As I mentioned, there will not be a formal Q&A session, but uh, you can ask Sing Sing your questions via Twitter using the instructions there. Search for account Global Immuno Talks. Find tweet that says, ask questions for Dr. Sing Sing. We're here. Reply to that tweet with your questions and mention hashtag global immuno. So with that, with that, this concludes this week's global immuno talks series. And I thank you all for joining. And I thank you, Sing Sing, for giving us such a wonderful lecture. Bye for now. Thank you so much, Bali and everybody. Bye-bye, everyone.